All right, we're underway again, and we're picking it up on lesson four, page 53 of your, of your outline. And remember, we're in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. We are taking the Sermon on the Mount as a unit. We're not taking a, anything out of it piecemeal and uh, exegeting that section and leaving the rest to your imagination. Again, we're trying to treat the Sermon on the Mount like you would treat your, ser your pastor's sermon. If he does a 45-minute sermon, it wouldn't be fair to him to take five minutes out and say well, that's what it's all about. You would cover the whole sermon. So interpretation is important, and context is critical to interpretation. So we have... Um, we talked a little bit about the dispensation of law, how it began in 1446, and how it is uh, moving along merrily until we come to Passover AD 30, where the dispensation of law begins to fade out, and the dispensation of grace begins to fade in. And today, we are 2,000 years down the timeline in the dispensation of grace. So we're well into the dispensation of grace, maybe even close to the end of it. But... Um, where was the Sermon on the Mount preached? The Sermon on the Mount was preached way back here, a year and a half to two years before 30 AD. And so there's a year and a half to two years of the dispensation of law that remains. So we have to view this as happening during the dispensation of law. We reviewed the covenants. We looked at the Abrahamic covenant versus the Mosaic covenant. We saw the Abrahamic covenant was eternal and unconditional, the place of spiritual blessing, the Mosaic Covenant, in contrast, is temporary and conditional, and it is a temporary administer, administrator of the Abrahamic Covenant. Covenant, And I, I emphasize you've got to keep these two separate, and when you don't, nothing but confusion results. Everything just goes uh, out the window. So there's the Abrahamic Covenant with its three basic promises, and the eternal and unconditional Abrahamic covenant was expanded and developed by three additional eternal and unconditional covenants that God made with the Jewish people. The land covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. The land promise being expanded by the land covenant, the national promise being expanded by the Davidic covenant, and the spiritual blessing promise expanded by the new covenant. And remember, the Mosaic covenant was added to the Abrahamic Covenant according to Galatians 3.19. Added as a temporary and conditional administrator. All the promises had to go through the Mosaic Covenant for a period of time. However, in 30 AD, the New Covenant was instituted and therefore the Mosaic Covenant was rendered inoperative. It had fulfilled its purpose. It ceased to be mandatory. It ceased to be a rule of life for the believer. It continues to be holy, righteous, and good, and relevant because we can mine it for riches and for uh, applications to our lives, but it is not required. It is not required. The rule of life today is the law of the Messiah, the New Covenant, uh, the New Testament as we call it. So this is what we live under today. And remember, I said this was a great arrangement because... Under this arrangement, the uh, Gentile believers are grafted in. Under the New Covenant, there's your portal into the place of Jewish spiritual blessings. The uh, Gentile believers inherit Jewish spiritual blessings, which is a great privilege. So there's where everybody fits in today. And so remember I talked about having two kinds of olives on the olive tree. You know, us, uh, us Jewish believers, us Jewish Christians were the natural olives, kind of mild and you know, flavorful, but you guys were what? You guys were the wild ones, okay? You are the wild olives, okay? And by the way, I happen to mar marry a wild olive myself, so <laughs> kind of like them a little spicy there. <laughs> All right. All right, so let's pick it up then, uh, where we left off. And uh, we left off, well, let's, in uh, Matthew 5, 17 through 19, let's reread Matthew 5, 17 through 19. That will be section 67. Section 67, page 53. 53. All right, verses 17 through 19. 
Do not think I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So verse 17 gives us the Messiah's attitude toward the Torah, toward the Mosaic law. It's not to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Well, remember, the additional traditions of the Mishnah often rendered the Mosaic law null and void. And we'll begin to see that as we get into this more and more. But Jesus came to fulfill it. He came to complete its intention. And again, remember, that means he will be the only Jew who will keep the law perfectly. Perfectly. He will obey all of the commandments that apply to him. But the law at this point is fully obligatory, fully obligatory until after his death. And then that new covenant begins to start functioning. Now the point here is that the Pharisees have perverted the law by, number one, making the Mishnah obligatory and reinterpreting the law through the Mishnah. But his point is that he came to fulfill the law as it is written not as interpreted by tradition. So the written word of God is our guide. That is our guide. And he says not one jot or one tittle will be unfulfilled. Now that says something about Yeshua's commitment to the written text. Now what exactly does he mean here? Well this is on the bottom of page 53, the next few slides. And this is the Hebrew word Ariel. And I just chose to use that word because it contains the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. There's the smallest letter, the Yod, the Y sound. Or as it's referred to in the text we just read, the Jot. The Jot. That's the smallest Hebrew letter. So his point is the law will be fulfilled right down to the smallest letter. But he gets even more specific than that. He talks about the tittle. And there are several he uh, Hebrew letters that are distinguished by this element. For example, here is a dalet. This is the D sound for all you uh, beginning Hebrew <laughs> students, right? The D sound, right? The dalet. And this is the resh, the R sound. <coughs> the R sound, right? Trillet. Now, what's the difference between these two letters? The only difference between them is right there. One little stroke of the pen extends beyond the descender. That's the difference between a D sound and an R sound. Now, this is what makes Hebrew so maddeningly difficult to those who have started it for the first time. We're not used to looking at these tiny little strokes of the pen. Another example, there's the bet, the B sound, B. And here is the cough, the K sound. And again, what's the difference between the two letters? Again, one little stroke of the pen extending beyond the descender. That's the whole difference, the whole difference. So the Messiah is saying that he will fulfill the law down to the smallest letter down to the smallest stroke of a letter. He's going to do it all and do it all perfectly. Now the rabbis also speak to the importance of, the, of every stroke of the text. They see every stroke of the text as very, very important. And uh, an example is on the uh, third slide there. On your outline, I'm going to bring a quote forward from Tanhuma 1.1. In Tanhuma 1.1 you read, It is written, and that's Deuteronomy 6.4, the quote, The Lord our God is one Lord. He that changes Dalit into Resh destroys the world. Wow. All right, what is he talking about? Here's the reason. It would read, The Lord our God is another Lord. Okay, you change one letter and you totally change the meaning of the text. How does that occur? 
Well, here I'll show you. There's the English version of Deuteronomy 6.4. Here is the Hebrew. Reading from right to left. Uh, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And there's the key word that we're concerned with. The word Echad, the last word in the sentence. Now let's pull out that word so you can see it a little bit better. There is Echad. Basically it means one. And it ends in a dalet. Correct? Right? It ends in a dalet. But there's another Hebrew word. There's another Hebrew word, and that's the word acher, which means another, and it ends in what? The resh. Yes. What's the difference between these two very different words? One has the tittle, and one does not. Okay, so you see what the rabbis mean when they say, it is written, the Lord our God is one Lord. He that changes Dalit into Resh destroys the world. Why? Because it now reads, the Lord our God is another Lord. Instead of promoting monotheism and one God for Israel, all of a sudden, polytheism, many gods, is being promoted. One stroke of the pen can change the whole meaning of the sentence. That's how important every stroke of the pen is in the Jewish community. And so it's not surprising to hear this very, very similar statement on the lips of Yeshua, isn't it? I will fulfill the law to the smallest jot, the smallest letter, and the smallest tittle, the smallest stroke of a letter. So what's the implication of all this? Well, the implication lies in the fact that the age of the law is still in effect, and he's saying that the entire law is mandatory. It must be kept at this time. So the Sermon on the Mount as a unit cannot be ethics for this age, because the whole law must be kept in every minute detail. And you know the temple's gone. Can we uh, keep the sacrificial system in any way, shape, or form? Without the temple, the law's gone. You know? How about any kind of sacrifice? Maybe you could bring a lamb to your church for sacrifice up front, you know, on Sunday. Would that work? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And if you break the law, what is the consequence? Judgment. There's curses of the covenant and blessings for the covenant. So if you break the law, you're under the principle of law, and breaking the law brings punishment. And that includes tithing at a rate of 23%. That includes... Um, Resting in your home on Shabbat. That includes wearing clothes with two types of thread and the food laws and on and on and on and on. So this is not ethics for this age. But we can principalize some of the aspects of the Sermon on the Mount uh, and apply them to our lives. All right, let's go to page 54 at the top. And we'll pick it up on Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. So we're at page 54 and verse 20 in section 67. All right, everybody all set? For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So in this verse, Yeshua repudiates Pharisaic interpretation of the law. You've got to have a higher standard of righteousness than the Pharisees are demanding. Now, in the upcoming sections, he's going to contrast his interpretation of the law with the Pharisees' interpretation under six basic headings, six basic examples. And as we look at section 68, we're going to encounter some key phrases. And uh, those uh, the verses in which the phrases appear are listed for you there on page 54. And the phrases go something like this. You have heard that the ancients were told. Or, you have heard that it was said. Or, and it was said. Something like that will appear in your, in your translation. 
All of these expressions refer to the oral law. They refer to the Mishnah. Now when a reference is directly to the written law, the phrase will go something like this. It is written. It is written. Now remember, the Mishnah was still in memory form at this point. It was not written down yet. It wouldn't be written down for about 200 more years. So Jesus will take a doctrine of the Torah, a doctrine of the Mosaic Law, and he'll contrast his interpretation with the, Pharise with the Pharisaic interpretation of the law as found in the Mishnah. And the contrast is going to center around this idea, that the law demands more than the mere act. The law demands the attitude of the heart, the intent and attitude of the heart. You can't have one without the other. You have to have the correct attitude and the correct action. That's the principle behind the law. All right, any questions there? All right, so let's take a look at section 68. We're in lesson four, page 55 at the top. And we'll start looking at these six contrasts in interpreting the law. So let's begin in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. And you can see there that Matthew is the only one that covers this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. So verses 21 through 26. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever shall say, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. If therefore you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way, in order that your opponent, opponent may not deliver you to the judge and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. <coughs> Truly I say to you, you shall not come out from there until you have paid the last cent. All right. The first contrast deals in verses 21 through 26 with murder. Now the Pharisees emphasize the act only. You've got to drive that knife into that guy's heart before you murder him. Okay, once you do that, then you have murdered him. But Jesus says that preceding murder is the hatred of the person. Preceding murder is despising the person. And this is very clearly taught in the law. For example, Leviticus 19.17. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen where? In your heart. Okay? Talking about the inside of us, isn't it? Our soul. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but shall not incur sin because of him. So the law clearly taught that Sin begins in your heart. That's the basis. That's the foundation. Now, this term racha in Hebrew it means basically empty-headed. A modern American expression might be uh, you turkey. Or what? Well, fool, yeah. Or stupid, something like that, you know. Airhead. 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 Okay. <laughs> Similar kinds of insults. Okay. This crowd knows. This crowd knows, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, keep your seat. Okay. <laughs> Question. In the 613 laws, in the very beginning, it's up to offend your fellow person is, is equivalent to murder. Exactly, yeah. To take sure. reputation away. Sure, exactly. Exactly. This is very clearly taught in the law. That sin begins in your soul. In our, our soul. So this term, raka, for example, means, uh, you know, stupid head, airhead, thinking like that. And there is a parallels in rabbinic literature. 
For example, the Babylonian Talmud, Maasei Baba Metzia 58b. Atana recited before Rabbi Nachman ben Yitzhak, he who publicly shames his neighbor is as though he shed blood. See, there you go. The rabbis understand this. Just shaming somebody, making them embarrassed is like killing them. You know? You don't want to shame your brother, embarrass them. Here's from Baba Metz, uh, Masei Baba Metziah 58b. All who descend into Gehenna sub subsequently reascend. That's a reference to uh, the rabbinic doctrine of purgatory. That's where it came from. All who descend into Gehenna subsequently reascend, excepting three who descend but do not reascend. In other words, there are three types of people who will suffer eternal punishment. And here they are. He who commits adultery with the married women, publicly shames his neighbor, or fastens an evil, an evil epithet, nickname, upon his neighbor. So when you go around, according to the rabbis, if you go around calling your neighbor stupid head, you know, there goes old stupid head Solomon, you know, something like that, and embarrassing him and shaming him, the rabbis are teaching, uh, you're worthy of eternal punishment. So the rabbis understand this very, very clearly. Jesus is, say again? Yeah, kind of like bullying. Yeah, we're having a bad problem with bullying these days. Same kind of thing. So, it's in the heart that counts. And the rabbis know this. But, let's take up this term, fool. Remember Jesus talked about the term, fool? If you call somebody a fool, you're guilty enough to go into the fire of hell. Well, you know, you look in the Talmud and you find this term, fool, all over the place. And most surprisingly on the lips of so august a rabbi as Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Remember him? Remember that guy? He comes up over and over again. So here is from the Talmud, Maasei Baba Bathra 115b and 116a. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai joined issue with them and he said to them, fools, whence do you derive this? And I've edited it down a little bit. He said to him, oh master, do you dismiss we with such a feeble reply? He reference to Yochanan, said to him, Fool, shall not our perfect Torah be as convincing as your idle talk? So what is Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai doing here? He's calling this guy a fool and he's humiliating him, isn't he? You know, when I uh, came across all this stuff, I realized that Yeshua is preaching in Galilee. And he's being investigated by the rabbis. What is this uh, ministry, this uh, messianic ministry? Is it uh, genuine? Is it, uh, is it uh, a valid ministry? And there weren't a whole lot of rabbis up in Galilee, but who was up there? Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, wasn't he? He was a Galilean rabbi for 18 years. You know, as I read the Sermon on the Mount, I just wonder if Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was not in the audience. A man who seemed to like to use the word fool. You know, I wonder how this sermon hit him in his heart. Don't use the word fool. Don't humiliate your brother. I just wonder if he could have been in the audience and what his reaction might have been. Another example <coughs> from Menachot 65a and b. For the Bothusians, now the Bothusians were members of the high priestly family of Bothus. In other words, they were Sadducees. For the Bothusians held that the Feast of Weeks must always be on the same day after the Sabbath. But Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai entered into discussion with them saying, Fools, fools that you are, whence do you derive it? Master, said the other, is it thus that you would dismiss me? Fool, Yochanan answered. Should not our perfect Torah be as convincing as your idle talk? Again, another time where he is recorded as uh, humiliating his uh, brother and calling him a fool. But he wasn't the only one who used this term. Here we have another entry. Uh, a woman is speaking and she says, she replied to him, you fool. Look at the end of the verse. Another entry. When he had finished his prayer, he said to him, fool, is it not written in your law? Another entry. He replied, you fool, turn to the end of the verse, and over and over and over again, etc., etc., etc. The Talmud has this 
this terminology throughout it. So it was a very common insult that was being thrown around by people in Yeshua's day. Okay, kind of a, a, point, a pointed sermon, isn't it? So the, the uh, problem is our heart. It's in the heart that sin occurs. It's what's in the heart that counts, both then and today. It's our attitude. Now we can see the rabbis were very aware of this doctrine that Jesus was teaching. They were aware that it was biblically, biblically consistent. It was consistent with what they taught, but they will still reject him. All right, let's move on then to Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, and our next example. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. So these verses deal with adultery. And again, the Pharisees emphasized the act only. But Jesus goes a bit deeper than that. He says, look and lust. That's your internal attitude. And you are guilty. And again, this is something that was very clearly laid out in Scripture. This is nothing new. Proverbs 6, 23 through 25. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is light, and reproofs for discipline are the way of life, to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty where? In your heart. You know, ne nor let her capture you with her eyelids. Well, can your eyelids grab you and capture you? No, not literally, but you know, look at those smoky eyes she's got. Ooh, she's so cute. You know? <laughs> All right, see that? So it's very, 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 very clearly taught in Scripture. Very, very taught, very, very clearly taught in Scripture. Nothing new. Adultery is carrying out what is already in the heart. All right, let's take a look at verses uh, 29 and 30. 29 and 30. And if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you that one of, your, one of the parts of your body perish than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it's better for you that one of the parts of your body perish than for your whole body to go into hell. Well, is Jesus telling his audience to mutilate themselves? No, he's not doing that. Remember, always keep in mind that this is hyperbole. Good Jewish hyperbole. What is hyperbole? Exaggeration for emphasis. Exaggeration for emphasis. You and I have done it a million times, right? No, we haven't done it a million times. Only a few hundred thousand, right? You know, you've said that to your kids. Dave, yeah, everyone is doing it. David, I've told you a million times, don't do that. You know, that's hyperbole. That's hyperbole. The idea behind this exaggeration for effect is this. Deal seriously and severely with this issue of sin. Take it seriously, deal with it severely if you ha have to. He's not literally telling us to tear out our eye or cut off our hand. If you did that, what would happen five minutes after you lost your hand? You'd sin again, right? Because sin isn't located in your hand. Sin is not located in your eye. It's in your heart. So if you're going to cut something off, where do you cut? Right there, you know? <laughs> you got to cut your head off, you know? You got to, that's the end of it. Okay? So sin does not originate in our body parts, but in our soul, in our mind, our will, and our emotions. And then they get, it gets expressed outwardly through our bodies. All right, let's... Uh, Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, dealing with divorce here. Verses 31 and 32. And it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let her give, 
let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the cause of unchastity, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now this is just one piece of a much more complex pie dealing with this issue of divorce. So we're not going to touch it here. We're going to gather that information together and then later on when this subject comes up again we'll deal with the whole issue bringing all the data together in one place, okay? Alright, so we're going to skip over it here and not elaborate on it here. Alright, I have 745 so let's go ahead and take your break, listen for the shofar and we'll come back on the bottom uh, of page 55. Alrighty, we're back underway again. Now we're picking it up at the bottom of page 55 uh, with Matthew chapter 5 verses 33 through 37. And this section deals with oaths. So Matthew 5:33. Everybody get there okay? Alright, again you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no, and anything beyond these is evil. So verses 33 through, seven, through 37 deal with oaths. And the Pharisees were very well known for the many, many oaths that they took. In fact, in the Mishnah, there is a, a whole tractate, a chapter devoted to oaths. In my particular copy, there's about 12, 10 or 12 pages devoted strictly to the subject of oaths. And it's not that you can't make a vow. It's not forbidden to make a vow or to swear, as it says here. But Jesus says it's better not to make a vow at all. It's better not to swear at all. Just honor your word. That's good enough, or that should be good enough. We shouldn't have to, um, you know, we shouldn't have to emphasize that uh, we're trustworthy by saying, you know, on my sainted grandmother's grave, I'll do this, you know, <laughs> something like that. We shouldn't have to do that. And that's exactly what uh, James says in James chapter 5, verse 12. He picks that whole idea up. And he says, above all my brethren, do not swear. You know, don't uh, take vows. Either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. So James is saying... Mean what you say and say what you mean and leave it at that. That's all you really need to do. All right, let's move on to verses 38 through 42. And this is a lesson four, page 56, top of the page. Verses 38 through 42 deals with uh, retaliation. Verse 38, we're on page 66 now. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist him who is evil. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat, uh, coat also. And whoever shall force you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Retaliation, the law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Uh, whenever this law is abused, it's used for revenge and animosity. That's not the purpose for this comment about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. When correctly applied, it, uh, it speaks of judicial punishment only. And the thought here is that the punishment must fit the crime and no more. The punishment must fit the crime and go no further. That's the idea. So Jesus basically says here, don't focus on your rights. 
You don't always have to claim your rights. Instead, focus on your responsibilities. Extend generosity and kindness to the other person. There's a limit to uh, punishment. And it cannot, it cannot slop over into revenge and animosity. All right, let's move down to verses 43 through 48. Now we're in the middle of page 56, dealing with love. 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than the others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Now, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls reveals to us that the um, Essenes taught, hate your enemy. For example, 1 Qumran 1, 1 through 9. God commanded by the hand of Moses and all his servants, the prophets, that they may love all that he has chosen and hate all that he has rejected, and that they may love the sons of light, each according to his lot in God's design, and hate all the sons of darkness, each according to his guilt in God's vengeance. Now, the Pharisees didn't go that far. The Pharisees didn't ta uh, teach, hate your enemy. Uh, but they had a limitation to love. They said, your neighbor is really your fellow Jew only. Your neighbor is your fellow Jew only. But Jesus says here that basically your neighbor is someone with any need that you can meet. Any need that you can meet. So uh, don't demand your rights and um, deal, with, deal with people with love and compassion. Now we come to section 69, page 57. Lesson 4, page 57. And the section is entitled, Three Hypocritical Practices to be Avoided. This section will deal with uh, a repudiation of Pharisaic action. The first section dealt with a repudiation of Pharisaic interpretation. And now he repudiates Pharisaic behavior or action. And again, He's going to contrast the external with the internal. So we begin with Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. And so this is on page 67 of your harmony. Section 69, Matthew 6, 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Now Matthew 6.1 brings out a principle. And the principle basically is this. The practice of true righteousness is done in secret. It's not done for self-glory. It's not done to benefit yourself. And then Jesus gives us three examples dealing with true righteousness. Verses 2 through 4. When therefore you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your alms may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. So again, this begins with the giving of charity. Alms giving. Now apparently, some of the Pharisees went around blowing trumpets to announce their gift in public. And Jesus here condemns ostentatious displays of charity. Okay? In contrast, true righteousness is done in secret. So if you're going to give somebody charity, 
do it in a private manner. Don't display it for everybody to see. See how wonderful I am and how generous I am. But you know, the church has not escaped this trap, have we? You know, many churches make a big deal out of giving. And you know, those who have one dollar can feel guilty because they only have one dollar. There's no reason for those who have little to be ashamed of giving little. And the same is true on the other side of the coin. Those who give more should not be proud of it. So Pharisaism has not escaped the church. We should give in secret. The widow's might. You're right, the widow's might. We'll talk about that in a little while. Yeah, we should give with all our might, yes. Whether it's a might or mighty, yes. <laughs> there we go. So, you know, when you give, use an envelope. Do something like that. Just write, put your gift in an envelope, seal it. You know, let the church take care of it. Just keep it privately. And, uh, you know, secret giving was a rabbinic ideal as well. This is not outside the, the thinking of the Jewish community. For example, in the Talmud, Baba Bathra 9b, Rabbi Eliezer said, A man who gives charity in secret is greater than Moses, our teacher. That's high praise, isn't it? If you give uh, privately, confidentially. And many, many centuries later, Rabbi Maimonides said this, There are eight degrees of almsgiving, one lower than the other. Supreme above all is to give assistance to a fellow man who has fallen on evil times by presenting him with a gift or loan, or entering into a partnership with him, or procuring him work, thereby helping him to become self-supporting. Now, isn't that a great statement? Yes. The best kind of charity is to get the guy off the welfare rolls. Get him self-supporting. Get him confident in himself. You know, boy, we sure need that today. You know, in our, in our economy today. Next best is giving alms in such a way that the giver and recipient are unknown to each other. This is indeed the performance of a commandment from disinterested motives. And it is exemplified by the institution of the chamber of the silent, which existed in the temple, where the righteous secretly deposited their alms and the respectable poor were secretly assisted. So there was plenty of opportunity in the temple to give privately, to give confidentially. But it went farther than that. In the Tosefta Shekalim 2.16, line D. Just as there was a chamber of secret donations into which donations for the support of the poor were deposited without fanfare, and from which contributions to the poor were handed out without much public announcement in the sanctuary in the temple, just as there was a chamber of secret donations in the temple, so there was such a chamber in each and every town. So every town and village in Israel uh, provided opportunities to give in secret. You had plenty of opportunity to do so. Is that, is that why they had different chambers in the, in the uh, temple? Yes, the temple complex had a lot of different chambers for different uh, different reasons. The wood chamber, the... Uh, the Nazarites chamber, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of buildings on the temple complex. And we'll be looking more into that when the temple becomes more prominent in this study. Yes, Carolyn. When Yeshua said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, is it, I always wonder what that expression really meant or why you used it like that. Was he saying, just don't announce it? Is that yeah, it? yeah, it's hyperbole for keep it secret. Keep it secret. Keep it, you know, be so conscientious, and of course it's impossible for your left hand to know it, to be ignorant of what your right hand is doing. You know, it's hyperbole. But you know, just like with uh, treating sin severely and, and uh, seriously, take giving that way too. You know, make sure, pay attention, make sure you keep it confidential. Don't make it a, an opportunity to boast about your generosity. No ostentation shows of giving. That's the idea there, yeah. All right. Okay, let's move on to Lesson 4, page 57. At the uh, bottom of the page, we come to the next example of a hypocrit hypocritical practice to be avoided in relationship to prayer. 
So now we pick it up on Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6. When you pray, you are not to be as the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners in order to be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. So again, prayer is not to be an opportunity to show off your oratory skills. You know, you've seen that the types in prayer meetings, the prayer start, and they normally talk like you and me, but when they go to prayer, it suddenly becomes the king's English, you know, these and thous, and, and uh, very flowery language, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. You know, prayer is not to be an opportunity to exercise oratory skills. So again, Jesus condemns an ostentatious display of prayer. Prayer is to come from the heart. And you know, the Pharisees were noted for ostentatious displays of prayer. Uh, for example, from the rabbinic commentary on the New Testament, the uh, rabbi uh, gives us some very useful information. He says, on fast days, prayers were recited outside in the open, you know, publicly. Individuals also prayed whenever they happened to be, wherever they happened to be, when the time of prayer was at hand, whether at work, while traveling, or under other conditions. So people prayed in public, but the Pharisees had special fast days. Their fast days were Mondays and Thursdays. They made sure they, pray, they, uh, they fasted on Monday and Thursday. So what are they doing on their fast days? They're going outside, very obviously they're the only ones praying, and they're taking advantage of this opportunity for an ostentatious display of prayer. So you knew that they were really, they were really frum, they were really observant. They were, they were fasting and they were praying out in public. So they just wanted to be seen. So this is what Jesus warns against. What days did they fast Mondays and Thursdays. The Pharisees fasted two days a week, Mondays and Thursdays. All right, let's move on to Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Matthew 6, verse 7. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father in heaven knows what you need before you ask him. Now, in pagan religions, prayer is not extemporaneous, but is usually prescribed in a prayer book. In fact, um, in some pagan religions, you really don't even have to pray. I believe it is in Tibet, you have your prayer wheels. And you take your prayer and you write it out on a piece of paper and you stick it in the prayer wheel. And the belief is, as long as you have the prayer, prayer wheel spinning, you're praying. So they go around all day and they're just hitting these prayer wheels and uh, they think the volume, uh, you know, is going to somehow move the heart of God. You know, that's kind of an extreme example of um, pagan religious prayer. Writing down a prayer and then putting it on a wheel and spinning it. Okay? If you, um, if you look at the uh, Old Testament, if you look in the Bible, you see that the Old Testament characters prayed extemporaneously. Okay? And the rabbis understood this principle. The rabbis understood this principle. In the Talmud, Maaseh Barachot 61a, Rav Huna further said in the name of Rav Meir, a man's words should always be few in addressing the Holy One. Blessed be he. Since it says, be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thy heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and thou art upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. So here's a warning against long, ostentatious, oratorical prayer. Just say it from your heart. And um, you don't have to have fancy language. In fact, one of the kings of Israel, was it Hezekiah, when he was ill? What did he do when it was told that he was going to die? He turned to the wall and groaned, didn't he? God heard that prayer, you know. 
Um, if you, if a, a three-year-old learns that her daddy is sick in the hospital with cancer and is going to die, and she says, "Oh God, please save my daddy," do you think God's going to ignore that? Oh Lord, the God of Israel, God of heaven and earth, please bring your healing power upon you know. And we don't have to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> Just speak from your heart, okay? And let your words be few. Let your words be few. The rabbis understood that. They're fully in accord with it, what Jesus is, Jesus is saying here. The Mishnah, Maaseh Avot 2.13. Rabbi Simon said, Be careful with the reading of the Shema. The Shema is Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Be careful with the reading of the Shema and with prayer. And when thou prayest, make not thy prayer a set task. By that he means, that means, don't make your prayer a certain time of day. I have to pray at 3 o'clock each day, I pray for 15 minutes. And the next day, at 3 o'clock for 15 minutes. And I'm a holy person, I'm a righteous person, I'm a good Christian, if I pray at 3 o'clock every day for 15 minutes, something like that. Don't make your prayer a set task. Now you can do that. You can do it if it's from your heart. But rather, make prayer an appeal for mercy and an, entre and an entreaty before the all-present. In other words, make your prayer come from your heart. You know? Make it come from your heart. Not just something you do wrote every day at a certain, certain moment in time. Or something like, well, I have to pray today. You know? <laughs> time to pray, so I better do it. You know? So God will be happy with me. Okay? That's the idea here. The, nevertheless, Mishnaic Judaism fell into the Gentile mistake. Here is uh, a, I just scanned in a couple of pages from one of the many Sidurim that I owe. A Sidur is a prayer book found in the synagogue. And I've got a bunch of these. And you can see on these pages the uh, prayers in Hebrew on the right side and the English translation on the left side. And basically, Rabbinic Judaism has fallen into this trap because in Orthodox Judaism today, virtually all praying is from a siddur, from a prayer book. You know, so when you see Jewish people praying, especially in the Orthodox community, what are you going to see? You're going to see the siddur in their hands. Okay, at the Western Wall. They're, these guys are praying, um, prescribed prayers out of the... Sidur. Here even is a more informal prayer meeting outside. But how are they praying? They're not thinking through the prayer themselves. They're just praying from the book. Praying from a Sidur. That's all you will ever... Look at even this young child. Dad is doing his best to turn him into a uh, righteous Jewish person. And what is he teaching him to do? To pray from a text. And there we go again. <clears throat> now, also, also, we uh, now get to the point of a rabbinic superstition of tucking your prayers into the Western Wall. Now, this is not that far away from a Tibetan prayer wheel, you guys. And the tradition is to tuck your, write your prayer, prayer out on a piece of paper and stick it in the West, Western Wall, the most holiest site in Judaism, and that'll make your prayers more efficacious. So, it happens all the time. When I go to Israel, I can bet that somebody's going to ask me, Bob, would you take my prayer to the Western Wall and stick it, in the, <laughs> stick it in the Western Wall? What do I tell them? No. I don't do that. I don't do that. Yes? I always wondered, does somebody go along and want yes. to clean all those out? Yes, they get cleaned out on, periodically. Yes. <laughs> Yes, they do. So you better hope your prayer's been answered by the time it gets cleaned off the wall. No. Okay, so um, I don't do that because I tell them that is just a rabbinic superstition. Writing your prayer in a piece of paper means nothing. Sticking it in a piece of rock means nothing. Prayer is to come from your heart. And God knows exactly what's going on in your heart. That's where he wants to be. But you know, it's really even gotten to the extreme in this uh, internet age. You can go to the Aisha Torah website and you can get your prayer into the Western Wall from here in America. <laughs> you don't even have to go to Israel anymore. 
<laughs> you don't even have to go to Israel. Here's what, uh, here's what I picked off the website. Place a note in the wall. It is a centuries-old tradition to place a note with a prayer or request in the Western Wall. So, the instructions on the internet. Type in your prayer. It will be printed out in the old city of Jerusalem. Oh, that's holy. Where it will be placed in the wall by a student of Eish Torah. This is a free service. <laughs> However, oh, <God>. there is great... <laughs> However, there is great merit in making a contribution and helping to support the service and making it available to others. If you would like to make a contribution, okay. You know, you guys, this is not prayer. Yes, question. Yeah, just a quick one. I mean, if, if, if there is something done through the heart, though, that it does come from the heart, or, or is it that, that it's been manifested in the mind? I mean, it's kind of where you're at it. If you're looking at it from a ritualistic, but yet... Can some of these things be done if it's done through the heart? Definitely. Okay. Definitely. If you have a siddur or some kind of a prayer written out that somebody else wrote out, and you read that, and you, and you identify with it, and you say, yes, that expresses my heart, then you can use that, because that is part of your soul being expressed. Someone might have written it out for you, but you're identifying with that. Sure, I don't think there's any problem with that. But what I'm worried about is this kind of a thing. When I used to go to Congregation Beth Shalom in Seattle, Washington, that's my, uh, I call it my synagogue, that was a conservative synagogue. And I would go to the Arab Shabbat service, the uh, Friday evening service. And I still remember this guy, we'd get up to, to do the Amida, the standing prayer, we'd have our Siddurim there, and this guy was next to me, and all of a sudden, we're starting the prayer, and he goes, Baruch atah Adonai, Adonai, he sits down. He went so fast in the Hebrew prayer that he ran out of breath twice. Then he had to stop and take a breath and do it and get done. You know, I got about three lines read. And he was down already. You know? That was just a... That was a sham. That was just the, what, what, what we say here. The, obligation. An obligation by the guy. He didn't... We wasn't identifying the words, but some of the words in the prayer book are really cool and really nice, and you can identify with them, but he wasn't doing that. So this is what Jesus is concerned about. You know, an ostentatious display of prayer that does not come from the heart. Okay, yes? Okay, real quick, um, if, if God knows what you need beforehand, why does he want you to ask him, or is prayer just really for your benefit? Relationship. That's why he wants you to talk with him. He doesn't want to be this, this distant, you know, um, cold God out there in somewhere in the spiritual realm. He wants to have a personal relationship with you and me. So even though he knows what's going to happen, he knows what we need before we ask it, he wants us to ask. Okay? You know, it's relationship. It's the whole thing. He wants us to talk with him. That's the key. What does he say? Pray without ceasing. You know, so we can be praying, driving on the freeway. We can be praying in our churches. Uh, we can be praying when we come out of that meeting that we just got lambasted. <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. You know? We can pray all the time. We can always be shooting arrows up to the Lord. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to be in constant contact. And that's not just an internet email service. You know, he wants us to be in constant contact with him. It's, prayer is more for us than for him. That's for sure. And he wants us to come from our heart, okay? Not from a prayer book. All righty. So on one hand, prayer should not be vain repetition. But on the other hand, it should be orderly and not haphazard. So we humans always have the problem of balance. We usually go to one side or the other. So in order to balance us out, Yeshua presents the model prayer. And we basically run out of time, so we won't be able to do the model prayer this week. Now, the model prayer is often called what? It's often called the Lord's Prayer. Right. But it is a model for prayer. It is really a model for prayer. And the church, unfortunately, has not escaped this trap of vain repetition. Vain repetition. What happens with the Lord's Prayer in many churches week after week? Many churches, week after week, what do they do? They repeat the Lord's Prayer. Okay, until it becomes this meaningless repetition for you. 
This is a model for prayer, an outline for prayer. And so we will look at it very clearly and carefully in what? Two weeks, right? Next week is Passover. Next week is Passover. We'll, pi we'll pick this up in two weeks. Okay, let me pray. All right, it's time to pray. Extemporaneously, from the heart, right? Father, again, we want to thank you for your word, especially uh, we've closed here on this very personal issue of prayer. And um, thank you for just talking to our hearts regarding this and emphasizing that you want a relationship with us. You want us to be keeping contact with you all the time for all the big and little things that come into our life. So Lord, help us to, to avoid the problems of prayer. Help us to recognize when we're trying to pray or we're trying to give or trying to make a statement for ourselves rather than to help others or build a relationship with you. Help us to keep self out of this and keep Yeshua and you to the forefront. And that's hard, Lord. We need your help to do this. We need it. So help us in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, we'll see you in two weeks.